away as revenue streams as well. So I agree with you. There are a lot of levers that we have to pull, a ton of levers, right. and they all have to work together. And I think if you look at the financials, I can pull them up. I mean, we have increased our ability to collect dollars from the hunt. We are now year-round hunting. We're also trapping. Year to date, just in the way that the, mar the books are marked, you've collected almost $30,000 more from the hunt than you did last year, which was $50,000 from the year before that. So we are doing everything we can. Not only that, we're looking at expenses. How do we ratchet down what we're doing? Um, in the financials, I think you can see that we're, we're doing everything we can to pull every lever, ratchet down the expenses, increase the commercial areas, look at where we're behind on the systems. Not one of these things is going to fix our problem, and it's not going to fix it fast. Every one of these levers has to be pulled, and it's going to take a lot of smart minds and a lot of people, you know, facing the facts that this is where we're at. I mean, we didn't make this situation, but we do have to live with it. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, why does the port have lots that they won't sell? So currently, um, and this is, do you want my personal opinion or the opinion of the, the I mean, in general, the way that it's been discussed, um, now, if you have an asset on the book, now is not the time to sell that asset until we get the condition of the port where it would be that it could bring in a top dollar as far as a revenue stream. So, yes, right now we could go out and we could sell 10 lots for $3,000. We're going to bring in $30,000 one time. Or we could go and wait, and I know the real estate agents have sold these lots for $10,000. So do we take the opportunity to bring in revenue streams, reinvest from the hunt, reinvest from the motel, Maybe develop some of our own properties on the property that we have and garner a, a number that's way higher than that or just take the one time shot in the dark, let's bring in $3,000, we're going to spend that on AC units like immediately and now we're not running down the path. Yes sir? You could, I think you would still have the membership, the monthly assessment. You would. The 10. But until we get that in line, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're digging a deeper hole. Right. Back to the lot sales, um, technically you know, you're governing, I mean, you have the right to change your lot amount, mm -hmm. but I don't think the board has a right to stop selling. It's in your declarations that you have to sell. It's like... We have to lot up. We don't have no, to sell. No, there's nothing about lot ups in the declaration. There's nothing about that in the declaration. What's in the declarations under governing, and I think it's like J, if you want to look in the book, it says that the, that the board has to sell. If you have lots to sell, you have to sell them. You don't have to sell them at 3500 you guys can determine what you want to sell them for. If you're going to the market, it also says you can go for outside help. But to completely stop selling, if you have it, it's against your governing documents. We'll take that under advisement. I'll be happy to look into the fact that we I can or cannot it's stop. Jay under governance. Thank you. You have that? So uh, we also have, yeah, and so the other piece of that is the you, we have to look at how many we have to sell versus how many liabilities of lot ups that we still have out there. We don't. I don't so, have a liability for lot ups. No. No, I just you, got, no. If you look at the, if you, and it's not recorded, nothing's in the in the governing document, and, and it would, God would be wise to do something to to get it recorded. But whenever you look at the documents to lot up, it says in there that inventory may not be guaranteed. So you're protected in the lot up portion, but you're not protected in your governing when it comes to your performing lots. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. You know, I think everybody understands this, these pictures here, but I haven't heard anything about recruitment. What, what are we doing with recruitment? Is, this, is it being attempted or, you know, is there any figures that show about recruitment? Yes, sir. So, uh, recruitment-wise, uh, this last year we, um, and as most of you have pointed out over time, a majority of our members come from people who spend some time here in their RV and then end up purchasing a lot here um, or buying a property. Uh, we joined Good Sam last year to help promote uh, the port as well. But until we have an offering um, that we can say, like, this is what we want to do, we're kind of in a rebuilding phase. And I agree with you. Marketing is something that's on our list to, to jump out there with. We have a situation right now that our uh, website 
will not be um, compliant to like the standards of the internet here in, in short order. And that will be a big step for us moving to a marketing platform that will actually be accessible and usable in time. But again, we have to have something that we can market at the moment. And until we can fix a lot of the, the sins of the past, I don't know that marketing in us is going to help us at the moment. But we are doing, we are taking steps in that. That is something that we are aware that like, we have to start doing. And like, and, you know, as you all know, it takes a lot of levers to make this all work. It's a big equation. Okay, we're talking about marketing, bringing people in, uh, either on a vacation basis, permanent basis, whatever, uh, with increased HOA fees. We live in an area region, plain and simple, and this year has really proven that. Uh, to bring people to the port, we have to have something to offer. The pool was the biggest thing we had to offer. Uh, would the board consider buying a pump for that pool and purchasing water? Once we are able to purchase water, I, we're on, on a restriction now, voluntary. And I know it's not feasible right now, to purchase water. But in the meantime, if we get the rain, we'll have the pool under the spring. But if this happens again, we would have the pump availability. And also, run the pump when we're getting spring water. It would help uh, slow down the growth of the algae. You wouldn't have to clear the, clean the pool as often. So this is something as far as marketing and our amenities are concerned, I think should be considered. And, and thank you for bringing that up. So let's talk a little bit about what we've done with the pool to kind of make sure that we can, can um, use it as long as possible. And some of the analysis that's been done by the operations team so that you understand that we're, we're looking at a lot of things. So you are getting a ton of horizontal leakage out of the retention pond because over the last 50 to 60 years, you haven't seen a lot of maintenance done on the, the mortar that was between the stones that were put there in the late 30s. So we've repointed re that whole deal, looked at other areas that were leaking water horizontally. That will retain water in that retention pond. We also uh, brought the lift gate back into a state where it will hold that water that we've now been able to hold in there. So we're trying to make sure that we're protecting that spring flow. Prior to that, we met with Texas Parks and Wildlife, and we were on their list to come electrofish all of the non-native fish out of the retention area. That, that plant matter that they grind and don't swallow, and so they've already broken it down to the point where when the sun hits it, now you've got a situation where you're growing algae much yeah. faster. So those were already on the books to look at prior to this situation. Um, we've been in contact with Texas Parks and Wildlife since then to help us restock uh, with native fish that don't grind the plant life um, so that we aren't pushing to a situation where we're further degrading the water quickly. Um, we've also talked to the water district about helping us uh, purchase a pump system that rather than shooting the water down the, um, down the exit channel into the creek, we would take what I call the water bridge, which is the 750,000 gallons that lies below the piece that, that uh, goes from the entrance to the exit yes. and pumping that back into the retention pond when we clean. And so it would be diluted throughout the, the retention area that's there and then allow it to flow back into the pool, saving the 750,000 gallons each time. Now, it's a big benefit to the port to not have to clean that pool every week. Mm -hmm. Approximately 33 man hours saved every week. Wow. That's a lot. I mean, that's a lot of, of man hours when you really start thinking about, okay, can we hire, we all know how hard it is to hire people. You know, you've got to you know, deal with benefit packages, you've got to deal with compensation, all these things. We know it's a difficult situation. So if we can just magically bring 33 hours a week back into our work pool, it's huge. So there's a lot of benefit, and we've done a lot of analysis as to look at what we can do. I know that there's been some um, look at what we can do to help kind of treat the water and keep it from turning as fast. Uh, we will look at a pump system from my experience and conversations that I've had. 
um, a, a circulating pump system, I think is what you're talking about, to like move the water. Um, we have looked at that, but not in the pool area, where it would be, would be in, on the retention side to keep that water moving, to keep the state before it gets into the pool. Um, you have a little bit, uh, you have uh, an easier situation to work with in the retention pond than you do in the pool, mm -hmm. from a liability standpoint or sunshining standpoint. It's a whole different ballgame. But yes, we are looking into recirculating pumps um, and aerators to do that. Yes, ma'am. I appreciate your comment, years of sin. So whatever those years of sin, however many years of sin are, we as members should not be expected to make up for those years of sin in one year. Totally so agree. when we're looking at when you're looking at the increases <coughs> in the CPI and all of that, I do not believe that as membership that any one of us is willing to pay in one year for the years of sin. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I've been here since 2010, and obviously I was part of those years of sin. But I I am not looking forward to an eight a 9.1 close to 10 percent increase in fees in one year. I mean, and this CPI is not going to stay at 9.1 for the next five years. As soon as some things get squared away, um, that's going to start to come back down. So I imagine a great part of that is due to food and to um, gas. We're also in a situation here where we are dealing with a drought. How much longer is a drought going to go on? Um, I'm fortunate that I can do my grocery shopping in other places, but not everybody is fortunate to be able to do that. And so they're dealing with, you know, higher prices at Lowe's and things like that, and perhaps not going into Del Rio or Uvalde um, because of the price of gas. So while there's a 9.1% CPI, I think we need to be very cognizant of how that 9.1 CPI is affecting every single one of us, and we should not have to pay for the years of sin in one year. Totally agree, and, and that's where you can see that this has been a slow grind back. I mean, at one point, you were 23,000, no, 20, 22,9,23,152, you were behind per month, and so it has been a small grind back to where we are. And it's not just CPI, it's not just your assessments, it's all the levers. It's increasing the hunt, increase, you know, we, we, we'll call it that we were good at what we were doing, but it was happenstance, let's be honest. We redid the motel, the only reason DPS came here was because they had rooms to stay in. That's $250,000 that wasn't here and wouldn't be here. Yes, ma'am. So you said that these forms are disconsidering the membership. The years that the rate increases didn't go, we did pay for two special assessments and we've always, prior to last year, paid for a common property assessment. So that did bring quite a lot of revenue but that's not, that's not counted in this. So there was an influx but using those other assessments without... That's on a look back basis though. When you do a special assessment based on a deficit, that means you're doing a look back. You don't, have, you don't have the ability to plan. So how do you make plans three, five, six, seven years down the road if you don't know how far behind you're gonna be? So by doing a special assessment, I mean, I, I you know, if we wanna talk about a, a kick in the pants or, you know, something like where it's like, Oh my goodness, we have to do this? A special assessment at the end of the year? This is over every month. Well, this is a few dollars a month, saying. not a hundred, two hundred dollar check at the end of the year. But you're Let's doing people plan. But you did just off of the uh, regular assessments. You, did, you didn't bring in the credit from whenever we, we paid that, because that would have brought that deficit not as, da as far down. Was, you, sure. you understand what I'm saying? Like last year, we didn't, yeah. was very thankful that we didn't have to do the common property. And we're not going to do it this year either. Yeah, but, but to be accurate on your chart, you would need to show a credit of the revenue that came from a special or a common Well, there's always going to be revenue that's not accounted for in members. That's why this is membership revenue. Well, so there that's, assessments. That's, assess that's a special assessment, not membership revenue. So, I mean, are we going to throw in the $192,000 at your board? Is that going to be $192,000 that we got in for the $400,000 that we're bringing in from the government on another day? I mean, we can't look at the one-time chances and the things that we, like, bring in on the basis of... That's not accurate. An assessment is something that you, if you don't pay it, 
you can put a lien on your property. So the common property of special assessment is like your membership assessment in, in the eyes of the law. It's still an assessment. So I think the numbers are not completely accurate when you're talking deficit. I'd be happy to add the... Right, the well, well, is that not what you want or you just want to make well, the no, point? I'm saying that it's, it's just a little bit deceiving. Paris, can I ask you something? I believe on the board since 2005, and I recall during those periods, it came back to me recently, there was a period where there wasn't a, an increase in the assessment because if I understand the CPI didn't, it, it wasn't above 2.5. So at that time, I recall some of the boards, there's some old board members here, they didn't do the increase because it just didn't, it didn't exceed the 2.5. But they could have done 2.5. Well, well, they could have done, but it was below 2.5. So I'm just saying that more than likely, that's what happened in the years that we didn't get an increase in some of the assessments. Sure, and I can totally appreciate where a board would say, um, we haven't had any increase in expenses, and so we don't need to do uh, an increase in the assessment. What I would challenge that with is, you maybe didn't have an increase in expenses, but you were spreading it out over less people. Mm -hmm. Well, also, though, the 2016 declaration took out, because the, there used to be a dollar amount, $252. So up until 2016, which has kind of been a nightmare, since now that we're Agreed. stuck with this, that 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 cap was taken out. So now it's a free for all for all the next boards to kind of really stick it to us. And like I said, we're only going to have 1,535 performing lots if we do not develop any new developments once we clear off all that non-performing. So we do need to put our hats on. We need to figure out how we can sell 2,000 FRMs. But like she said, we need something for people to want to come here. And then we also need to, like, make, you know, our, our commercial entities, make the customers pay more. You know, I mean, make us feel like we're special. I don't feel very special right now. We've raised the rates for the motel. We've raised the rates for the hunt. We've started charging people that are coming from outside for the pool. Um, I think that these levers are all things that we're going to continue to consider and that we have considered. Um, and as you'll see in the next few items, we have many more rate increases for outside members versus uh, the members that are here. So we are looking to pull in dollars from the outside. We just got to have the resources to be able to do that. Well, that would be helpful for this. If we can actually see what the public is paying, because if we just have a visual to see, you know, because right now we feel the back on the vested people, not people that just own lots or FRMs, but the people that actually have their, their homes here and are really vested here. If you can kind of show us, you know, how, because right now it sounds like you'll benefit more if you lived in Brackettville versus if you lived on a fort, and it shouldn't be that way. Have you driven in Brackettville recently? But yeah, but if you have access to come over here and use our trash and our pool and, and everything else, whatever, you might be able to just sleep over there and not have to worry about paying all this stuff and then just spend all day over here. You know, I mean, so I agree. This is one piece of the puzzle, and that's mm -hmm. why we've been trying to bite this off in small chunks. You know, we talked about CPI last month, we're talking about the membership assessment side here. Um, there's a lot more pieces, and I think over time we'll develop things where we can quickly show throughout the years, like, okay, these are the different pieces. We're developing this. Um, you know, this is just one stab at it. I mean, this is many, many hours of work to put this together and also go back and verify and back into it different ways, and multiple people have worked on this, and we'll continue to bring you information, and what you want to see, we'll be happy to do that, and thank you for giving us the information that you'd like for us to present as well. We're happy to put that together. Thank you, Travis. We we will have an increase in our assessment uh, when it comes to the common property tax will probably be raised, so we will have to pay more for that. Also. We have, we have budgeted for the common property, and and I don't foresee us having to do an assessment to cover common property as the has has been done in the past. So we will not be assessed for common property tax? I will not vote for a common property assessment. We haven't had a special assessment for two years. Technically, with this 2016 declaration, they're not allowed to do the common property. They only address the money portion. The only other assessment, as of, as of we're stuck with this declaration, would be the special assessment. The special assessment can go up to right now, it's like a little bit of $56 per lot. Because it's based off of every time we do raise the assessment, the board can impose a special assessment up to 10% of the annual amount. So every time we do go up on this one, there's a potential that they are they could do that for any deficit for any year. But the common property, as of the way that it's stated, they really can't impose that anymore. 
the way that it's set up. And that's a, the whole other conversation as far as like what's in the, what what are the levers um, that are out there? I don't think that a, um, you know, I was in an HOA that had a big issue and um, assessments to the point where uh, insurance actually kicked in. And I don't ever want to see us get there. So, you know, that's, so the more we can do to plan, and last year there's a gentleman that sat right here in this chair and talked to us about assessments and talked about being on a fixed income. And I told him that the best that we could do is to make sure that we tell everyone what our expenses are, what we're doing to make sure that those expenses are going down, and where we are and how far we are behind so that everyone can plan their lives accordingly. That's what we have to do. Um, and that's the best we can do. <coughs> Worst case scenario for me personally, I own two lots and one residence. Worst case scenario, how much more are you going to charge me a month? What am I looking at? Um, so the one, so the max, we had two different calculations. The max was between. Uh, I have eight to eight. I have eight to eight. What did you want? Sixteen dollars. Uh, seven seventy-seven. So for so your residential, it'd be three eighty-four. And then for the extra lots, it's three ninety three. So if you have two, so eight dollars. Well, if, if it's a single. Yeah, and if it's the full, like, and that's if you do the full thing. Exactly. Well, that's what she was asking for. Well, she said case. two lots, so the two <coughs> lots would be an eight dollar increase, three ninety, three ninety. Plus the residence. Plus the residence. Plus Plus the residence. residence. So, I get about twelve. So you're looking at twelve. Twelve. Yeah. Okay. Twelve dollars a month. That's max. And we don't have to be. I think, you know, personally, um, that we have to look, like you said, at all of it. And, you know, I look at our FRMs, which I don't even think that, you know, the last count I got was 72, not 126. Um, we need to boost our FRMs. That's. That's revenue that... How would you do that? Well, you have to have amenities. You know, who's going to pay for an FRM? How would you do that? Can I finish my... You said you're going to... Can I finish what I was going to say, please? Um, I don't have all the answers. But if we wait, we cannot put this all in the back of the membership. We'll lose members. I have people constantly talking to me about, um, you know, what am I getting? What am I getting for my money right now? And now we're talking about a fee for. Um, thank you <laughs> for the fitness facility, um, and it was our sin from the past that got the fitness fitness facility in the condition it's in now. So it, it's like, how much more? Can we can we put this on the back of the membership without in good faith? And I'm not saying we're not in good faith, but I still think there is more that we can do going forward. Yes, ma'am. I would like to see a chart or something that shows us what what the HOA fees are across the state of Texas, and not just with Fort Clark Springs. Let's take a look at what other HOAs are paying that may not even have the amenities that we have. I would love to see that. And, and I'll work with some other people to put that together. I, I'm willing to do that. But I, I think we need to not be so insular um, with when we, when we talk about HOA fees. Well, I've looked at a lot. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say our swimming pool is one of the best in Texas. Yeah. And I, you know, it's a big draw for us. I, I love the pool. I think it's beautiful. It makes me feel good. Um, I just want to make sure during this drought when it's empty that you know, we can preserve that. I, I know you guys are probably thinking about that, but I do know that that's a huge draw for us. And you're talking from a structural standpoint? Yeah. Okay, so um, when we uh, met before, we've had a lot of help from uh, the preservation uh, group, the, the Los Angeles Preservation Group, 
uh, they reached out to three separate engineering firms, including the engineering firm that worked with Balmeray. Unless we have like torrential rainfall, um, the structure of the pool in these conditions is a okay. Okay, so uh, I think we did cover the CPI index, uh, membership. Do we want to talk anything about amenities? I mean, we kind of know where we're at. Um, that amenity did come into that whole, so I think we wrapped all those in for now. And we have some work to do to add back to that. So we'll take that on for this next month. Uh, panic buttons. Okay, I've uh... Research. I have two quotes for our panic buttons because obviously that's sort of a hot button right now. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> regarding because of the issues in uh, Evaldi. The two quotes I have are so far apart. I've got to do some more research because we're not looking apples to apples. Um, everybody I talk to basically want to sell us a complete security system to everything we have, and that's not what we're looking for. So it's going to take another till next month to you know, figure out. Or we, it's a small enough amount of it, okay. But what we're trying to do is at least at a minimum have a panic button at the guard shack in front that if anything happens, they can hit that button and it goes straight to the uh, 911 and lets them know that they need help. So that's, that's sort of a must, and I just need to make sure we get the right equipment. You know, I, I have to say that I know a uh, lot owner here who had a very serious problem on her property. She was alone, she's widowed, and somebody is in her house and she called 911 and she was told, I'm sorry, we don't have anybody that can respond right now. I know somebody else who called 911 and nobody answered. So, you know, I, I mean, I don't feel safe. I, and it just doesn't have to do with the port. I mean, I feel safer yeah. on the port than any place else in the county, yeah. but I, I don't we, have the response. Yeah, I think we probably are, but I'm just trying to deal with things I can control. Yep. And so that's just a matter of, okay, what can we do to say, okay, we're doing what we can. To get the safety here, you know, yeah, we, we already know our security. Now, getting the radios will also help us get a, a little bit faster attention rather than go through cell phones. But no matter what, we we have to do our part to be able to contact 911 immediately for something like that. So that's why we do that. Can, can you explain that a little more? I'm, I'm not really clear what you mean by a panic button. A panic button is when anything that happens that they can't get to a phone or they can't get to a radio, they punch a button and it automatically does a call for emergency to 911 at the county. And it will flash where that button, they will, it will say the identifier where it's at. Very similar to the systems used in schools. Yeah. Okay. I, I hope <laughs> we'll be at the guard shack. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. So the teller. So well, it's just a the single ones are button rich. somewhere? Yeah, so, yeah. so like there would possibly be one at the front desk here. So if there's a an attendant here for the motel and there's an issue at night and they're in there by, by themselves and they have you know someone come in or there's an issue at the motel, they hit the button, go straight there. At the guard shack, you call in, this is happening. You know, they don't feel like they can appropriately respond to it. Hit the button, straight to the sheriff's department. Yeah. Thank you. And then open to the church department will answer. We did. I mean, it, so this goes to the thing. <laughs> County commissioners meetings. Go we'll talk to them. Tell them what does, you need. Does this? Uh, would this affect our insurance? Would it? It'll probably our help. It probably help. Do we know? We, I mean, like, if you talk to them about what that would do, or I, I haven't. Have a meeting. Jen said we will have a meeting with our insurance people in the next couple of weeks. I think as a whole, like us doing stuff like this, yeah, definitely helps. You know, in the realm of security and safety, uh, I'm hoping that we can, as neighbors, we can continue to look out for each other. Uh, I have a friend of mine that lives over there off of Pompeii and uh, Bull Lakes, and she had two scooters out in the front yard for her kids, and all of a sudden they walked away. And I asked her if she reported to security, she said no. I asked her to report it to so SO, she said no. But that's the first incidence I've heard up to today of someone's property being stolen 
right in front of their house. So, FYI. All right, so um, we had an item brought to us that we wanted to discuss the role of the general manager. So uh, we'll move to that discussion at this point. Okay. Um, there seems to be a question as far as my recommendations or my qualifications. So I've prepared a resume for all our board members that have questions. Since when I applied, I only did 10 years worth of history. That goes back to the day I was a ski bum in Colorado. Um, and I also will recuse myself from the conversation here. Y'all have fun. FYI, this is all a surprise to me, too. Okay. Who put that on the agenda, then? If no so, no, she, I did. she's I'm preparing her. She's preparing what, what she's saying. So she has I'll explain the background yeah, of it and why I put it on the agenda. Um, I'm just trying not to read an entire letter. Okay. Uh, just portions of it. Um, Gosh, about two months ago, I heard there was a need to look for some original files. We needed original permits. We needed original files on mud, um, trying to figure out our wastewater treatment system, our landfill, various pieces. I volunteered to do it. And so with Travis's okay, and then Alan's okay, or Mr. Peterson's okay, to look through the files, that's what I started doing. I started in the file room across from Allison, and then I moved into the file room across from the general manager's office. The files are a mess. It is amazing how many different filing methods have been used over the course of 50 years, almost 50 years. Some of the files are missing. You know, you we're missing policy resolutions are caught up through 2002, but then there's no consolidated group of policy resolutions from that point forward. Things like that, so that's what we're looking at. <coughs> through that process, I found, I was looking through uh, the board minutes from 1977, which is fairly uh, way back. It was the beginning of our of the, the fourth. And I found a letter from Jim Hester, who was the general manager at the time. He was uh, a little bit frustrated with the board because they kept trying to meddle in what he was doing. So this is some of the stuff he wrote. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's a long letter. I have inherited an organization that is very incompetent in many areas and overall is very inefficient. The supervisory staff was something less than professional at most locations. In the past five months, I've made changes at four department supervisor locations, three on are improvements, one maintained a good level. Other changes are planned at the proper time. Any pressure applied to me by individual directors may delay these changes since it interrupts the evolution process. Uh, I am a professional manager with a successful history of management, and that's what this addresses. That's why Alan did a, showed us his resume, which you know, we'll go through as a board. I cannot, cannot correct all the problems. This is 1977. <laughs> I cannot correct all the problems of Fort Clark Springs Association in three months, five months, six months, or perhaps even a year, but I will diligently try if I have cooperation and understanding from the board. Having a number of new department supervisors plus some older ones with bad attitudes and bad work habits makes the process much more difficult. The worst, the worst problem is the endless stream of directors, department supervisors, members, committee members, and our in our office, offices all day long. His assistant at the time was named Paula. Paula and I must have some time to do our work rather than with some rather strict rules 
um, that he's putting into effect to have people cooperate with him. And it goes on with things. He talks about quitting. <laughs> you know? And it, who was this? This was Jim Hester. But who was it written to? It was written to the board of directors at that time. That's why I found it in the board minutes from 1977. It was from November 2nd, 1977. It just hit home because of, of all the documents that I was finding and the things that I've been watching since I moved here three years ago. I've only been here three years, so I'm asking a lot of questions. I don't know everything by any stretch of the imagination. But I'm asking a lot of questions and that was one of the questions, what, what's going on here? And when I saw that, I'm going, wait a minute, that's kind of what we're going through now. Mm -hmm. So, all right, what's Alan's role? What's Mr. Peterson's role as general manager of the fort? Can someone else start that? Well, let me ask you a quick question. How long did you have, since you have that documentation, do you have documentation showing how long he was here? How the, yes. Did it last six months, did it last six years? Hang on. Yes, I do. She's busy. <laughs> well, while you're looking for that, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that the board prior to us did a, a, a good job um, putting together an employment agreement and, and specifically outlines the, the roles and responsibilities of, of the general manager. Um, so as far as his roles go, uh, I think the employment agreement is, is very succinct in, in putting that together. Um, you know, I, I, I would encourage everyone to review that agreement. Um, where, where is that agreement? Well, actually, uh, we, the, the role that we, the people, have is in our bylaws, and it says exactly yeah. what, what, what we, the members, expect. A question, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful or anything, because that really wasn't helpful for the association to hear, again, about the sense of the past. But before two months ago, I guess she would have been a volunteer. Did the, or protect themselves? Did, did she sign Absolutely. The so, yes, yeah, yes, we did. We actually brought it before the membership. We talked about it in the membership meeting, and that we did agree to have someone come in and look at the documents and any documents that were deemed as far as personnel. Yes, we did cover ourselves. But I'm just saying that this, this is being recorded, and someone can go on YouTube. They can go on YouTube and, and find what we talked about it too. This place and this kind of like always bashing it is, is not beneficial. I think it is beneficial to find documents from our past that show, like, if we continue to... As board members, absolutely, but to kind of spew it to people that, you know, we don't have any... These are your documents. The 1970... That's your documents, your minutes. You can request that at any moment. That is your document as a member. I just think that... I think the point I'm trying I think I'm assuming the point I'm trying to make is why we have something that happened almost 50 years ago. That's Let's we're see. here today, you know, I believe we're an effective board for the most part, and, and I've been supportive of Mr. Peterson, you know, so I'm, I'm But as a public record for all of us is that he has his roles as executive officer, you know, and, and that's, that's what's a, you know, it's, it's stated for official public records. His personal staff should not be, the, we're, not a, we're not a government entity, we don't need to know necessarily, you know, like all the ins and outs. We're still a private organization, so his privacy should be kind of protected, but we should also know his roles, and that's what we get to see in, 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 in this bylaws. Remember, this letter is not from Mr. Peterson. Right. This letter is from 50 years ago, almost, 1977. Uh, Jim Hester was on the board, was a general manager for one year and eight months. The longest we've had someone was six years and nine months, and that was Jean Britton. Actually, longer than that was Janelle Hobbs, when you add up all her time. All of her various time. times. She wasn't, she, wasn't even, she wasn't even ever an officer. Right. Uh, she, she was, was yeah, several so different I, I think the, the, the overriding goal here is that there is, there is a clear set of expectations, as Brianna pointed out. Um, there is a job description and there is a, an evaluation process that's being developed. So, uh, as membership, please um, understand that, that it, we're not just kind of flying by the seat of our pants. There is a process. We do have things that we expect of the general manager, and we're developing a review process that, again, wasn't here um, prior to us. So, just to keep y'all informed. Did you say the job description is being? He has a job. Yes, he, yes, he, yes, there's an agreement that he, you know, agreed to with the board that put him in the role, 
and you know uh, that's how we will build our review process based on what he agreed to uh, when he came in. Yes, sir. The previous board, or the interim board, made this description for the general manager. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So it was prepared before he accepted the job. Correct. Okay. Is there any reason that he has not followed his job description? That's for a review process that I can't just Well, I know, but I'm just saying, on. in general, he is doing his job, is he not? Correct. Yes. Hey, folks, shut up. <laughs> you hired a man to, to take care of this business because previously it has shown Boards cannot run this place. Right. Right? Yeah. So yes, nor do we want to. to do it. You accepted the guy's resume. You hired him. Leave him alone. Let him do his job. If he's not doing his job, then you have a fee. And I agree with you, and I think that this is more to, to quell the, the, con, you know, the concern within the membership is that there is a process, there are documents that govern that process, and we're following them. So. What's the problem? Well, you know, because you've been on the board ten times, so... <laughs> well, what is the problem when you have a manager who can do the job and he's doing it as best of his knowledge? The, 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 there is no problem. We're, we're simply providing information. Bringing it out. Well, somebody's complaining because he had to write up a new resume. No, I think he printed off a resume. He printed well, off his whatever. resume. Whatever. So one of the, one somebody, of the... somebody on this board... No. That's it's not, not happy with Alex. That's not happening. That's not the that case. Not this is coming from she the sphere. She chose to put this on the agenda. Well, I would have been Well, why do you got to go back to the bylaws? It doesn't matter. It's on the matter. The bylaws. If I had slavery people in my background, okay, that, that's, that's not where we need to go. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Herbert. It's over. It's done. It's history. Yes. Yeah, I agree. It's done. Thank you. We got to start from today and move forward. All right. We'll move to our agenda items. And the first agenda item, yes, please. The first agenda item is the fitness membership. Yes, ma'am. Would it be appropriate at this point to call on our board, you and Travis, for a vote, a vote of confidence for Mr. Peterson from the board? Did that put this to rest? I don't know the procedure for that. Um, I, I don't, yeah. I think yeah. what's probably the wisest where we need to start now, y'all, this is just a discussion item, so we can't vote on it. But I would just recommend that I'll go to the WhatsApp record and we look at the bylaws. Because it does say what the roles of the executive person is. And if it comes to any more questions from that, then, you know, then it can, if it needs to go any further, then it can go to an agenda item. But as of right now, since it's a discussion item, I don't believe any kind of vote would be wise. And I agree. And regarding Mr. Peterson, he's been here two years coming in August. And, and in my observation of him, he's a very hard worker. Well, through COVID, through uh, 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 a board that was not appointed, you know, he, he came in through a really, really crappy time. And he stood up, he stood up to it. So I think we all could give him some grace and some mercy. Thank you. We're, we're moving on. So, consider the approval for the fitness summer membership fees, $20 a month for non-members. I'm assuming we have further background on this. Well, if we're going before they just for non-members, correct? Right now, yes. Uh, mainly because of the fact, I mean, we were talking the other day because of the fact we are so short on amenities for our members. And we need to start at least charging for our non members. So, so the idea, I think, is that what I'm hearing here is that when we first discussed this and voted and approved the $25,000 expenditure by the association, that there was a discussion of a fee structure that would be put in place during that, that discussion. You could review the tapes. There was a discussion of it. It was mentioned by Robert Mummy, who said that uh, there would be a fee structure. How would it be structured for non-members and members? And that it was discussed during that meeting. Um, so, do we have uh, a recommendation as to what the 
fee structure should be at this point? I gave you a hypothetical budget on what it would cost yeah. to run a, what it's going to cost to do a fitness center, um, which I think I gave you all my own copy. Excuse me, Mr. Peterson, could you just pull your mic a little closer? It's not it's working. No, it's working. Oh, is it not working? It's not working. Sorry. It's working. Um, I gave a hypothetical, yeah, just a hypothetical, just to run the fitness center right now with hourly employees and you know, other expenses, it's going to cost us $76,000 per year. I mean, that's, that is a guesstimate at best. We have no idea what to expect. Um, but that would be working with, with an assumption of maybe 10 fitness classes, which would be a cost for a fitness class, which would be individual. But as far as the hourly rate just to run the place is around $50,000. Um, then, and the reason I went with the fitness center first is because we need amenities to promote our hotel. And the DPS officers, the one thing I know about people that stay in place for two weeks is they want something to do. And we had to protect the market we had with the DPS because that's why we're making money. So I mean, just the payback for having them there qualifies for doing the fitness center. But that is a temporary thing. That just allowed us to do it. Um, credit. Any guests from the RV park or the motel, they sign in there at the fitness center. That credits from the revenue in the, both the motel and the RV park. So, you know, we can get probably $25,000 of credit just from members there. That still leaves us around $30, $35,000 that we are, we are not covering. So, if you do a $10 a month for members, then you're looking at then you have to figure out how many members can you get from the membership. Now, a lot of people will qualify to get Medicare supplements from your insurance or any other insurances. That's one thing we have to pursue. Can't pursue that if it's zero. So, my recommendation is ten dollars for members, twenty dollars for non-members, and you just go with that and see how it works. And know that. It, this is a first time shot. We need to see how it works. We're lucky at the time now that it is keeping our DPS officers here. So we're getting the revenue back up from that. Can we talk a little bit more about the volunteer basis for the DPS officers? Yeah, the DPS officers right now have their choice of where to stay. They're not told where to stay or anything else. So it's basically they're wanting to stay here that has them coming back here. Almost all of them used our pool. That was a very big plus for them. They were going down there and working out there. They were relaxing. They enjoyed the pool. Obviously, that's not an amenity that they can run right now. So we saw it, and we don't have a restaurant. Uh, so you know, now at least we have something for them. That's why we changed working at opening up at 6 o'clock and staying a little later, because that's when they're working out. So they are using it. So you know, it's just a matter of okay, what are we going to preserve to keep that hotel full when we don't have a pool? Did and they use Creekside and Dickman? They very rarely use Dickman. As far as the bar, there have been a couple that have, but not on a consistent basis. Creekside, I don't know yet. Um, we've, we've encountered a few golfers down there that have taken some time yeah. to, to do that. And, um, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, it's sparse, but... I mean, if we were running with both the fitness center and, and the pool... Mm -hmm. Oh, we'd have every DPS I mean, officer then here. you got amenities. Possibly. And yes, I would love to have a restaurant, but the cost benefit of the restaurant wasn't anywhere near what that benefit was down there. So that's that's why we went... That's why we made that decision. Future, <clears throat> What's that? Restaurant in the future. Well, that's when we have to start realizing exactly what kind of money we have to work with. Because if you look, and this goes to, back to your assessments, okay, what kind of hole did we dig ourselves in? Well, if you just look at how much of your money from assessments goes to capital fund, you only bring in $75,000 a year to fix everything in this store. 
is a capital repair. That's fixing every, that's repairing every building, that's repairing every vehicle, that's repairing the pool, that's repairing everything we have. It's $75,000 for everything. Dickman Hall would cost you $250,000 just to fix that back up the way it should be. Creekside's probably going to be fifty dollars to $65,000. Air conditioners now are running $12,500 each for a five-ton unit. We probably have over 15 of them that need to be replaced in the port that do not work. So, without a reserve plan, which we had never had, well, there was one, have not had an accurate one. We really don't know what to expect. But I am, I have gotten it to the point that I know our assessments will give us $75,000 capital improvement. Okay, now we need to do a reserve plan on where we're going to spend that. Fortunately, because of the revenue from the motel, if you took 20% of that motel revenue and put it into reserves, that gives you an extra $480,000. That's where we're getting the money to fix things now, is from the motel revenue, the RV park, although he said it didn't make money, it just didn't make as much as it did. It's still going to make about $90,000. So if you take 20% of that, that's another $18,000 there. The hunt, if you take 20% out of that, there's another $20,000 you get. So that's where we're getting our money to fix things right now. But that's, and if we build on that, then okay, that's something we can look at. It, it may be consistent. Your return on a restaurant may get 10%. So if you're going to spend $200,000 to get a restaurant open, it's going to take 20, you know, 20 years? Yeah, to pay for okay. it. <laughs> From a restoration standpoint, there have been some grants that we've been able to procure over time, um, and we'll continue to look for them. Um, we, we're not as in bad shape as, as we sometimes, uh, you know, the, the rumor is that because we're a private entity. A lot of these things, though, require us to be putting money in as well. And so when we're having to kind of run behind and do our buildings that aren't historic, you know, people want to see us putting money into those buildings as well. And that we haven't, we're just not there yet. That is one reason we fixed work on the spring. Yeah. It gives us the history that we're repairing things on our own without doing the grants. It sets the history up that we're doing our part. But it's, it's nothing that's ever been you know, pursued. I don't, you know, like you said, I don't think that your private entity is necessarily a true thing. There are, there are a lot of, I mean, there are a lot of things out there that will go to something like that. The, the grant from the state that I just applied for, that's one that we may be up, but it's a small one. It's maybe at the most $20,000. So, $20,000 is $20,000. Yeah. And, and yeah. again, these are all, the, there's a lot of levers to pull. I mean, to start looking at, you know, the $3 a day for the hotel guest. I mean, that is pulling that hotel revenue into the amenities that are being used by the general membership as well. So there's a lot of ways to do this and a lot of levers to pull to make this happen over time. But we got to have a structure in place. And, and one of the first things, and it's on our agenda for executive session, but putting together a uh, finance task force to get our balance sheet in a position where when we do go for these grants, that's what they're looking at now as well. Not only what money are you putting in, but what money do you have to support yourself going forward? And if they're going to give us dollars, they want to know we're going to be here. Exactly. So. Okay, let me ask you this because I am very unfamiliar. Is there anything out there for structures like we have, our HOA, our and the amenity in the pool that we cannot use now. Is there anything out there that we can apply for under the title of drought relief? Yes, so there's a, there's a couple different things, and, and we have been collecting all of the documentation from the county because that's the trigger at most points. So it's a county trigger, a state trigger, a federal trigger. Um, 
that allows you to then apply for grants from the state um, based on that. So we've been collecting those documentations. We actually did apply a few months ago for uh, the ERC, um, which was a benefit for approximately $15,000 per employee that you were able to keep on staff through COVID. And that, at the time, was running uh, four quarters. They've amended it to five quarters, and I'm assuming we're going to probably get to eight quarters of relief. Of if you were able to employ uh, people over that time, you will get a credit of $15,000 per quarter per employee. So there are things that we're documenting, applying for, um, making sure that we're hitting all of those resources uh, as far as collecting the dollars that are out there for us. So yes, we are looking at those levers as well. I haven't seen anything for drought relief. Not yet, not yet, but but it will come. It is generally afterwards, but it, that's why I sent that around the other day when we declared the declaration of invasion. I mean, that's one of the things, that's one of the triggers for it, is what your first your county does, then the state, and then federally, what happens. Yes, ma'am. Uh, back to the um, agenda item about the membership fee. Um, Mr. Um maybe just a suggestion, just um, maybe like, you know, the residential people have residentials, which means, which, which is in compliance with our rules and regs. The people that, you know, husband and wife, they would, that, the, the gym would be free to them. However, if they have a family member that they can no longer claim on their tax return, like college kids coming here, maybe we charge them $10 the month because they're not really technically, I mean, they're still, it's like a guest of the membership. And yeah, then FRMs, since they're not vested, they don't pay a residential fee. They do the $10, and then, like you said, the public that are just renting or, or staying at the RV park or whatever, they, unless they decide to get an FRM, they pay $20, $25. I think that the but idea it, is to... Because um, there may not be a whole lot of people that use the gym. It may be mostly youth. And I'm just saying that's how you can kind of, since this is just a trial... But you kind of want to feel a little bit special when you when you have so much vested in here because we feel like we're just average. So if you just leave it to the people that have the membership, same way with the hunts. Like when, when we were up there, the people that had a residential, now I'm not just talking a lot. That means you have to have an 11 account. You have a flat fee for the season. Then FRMs, you're still a member, you have a per day rate, and then you double it for your for your customers. So just have a tier system where it feels like it, your, your best place to be is vested with a house here. Second best place would be have a membership, a, a, an FRM. Do, do you see yes, how, I, and that can yes. maybe, I don't know, it's just a suggestion. So what my recommendation would be for the motion that we have here is to have a, not have a membership fee for your, all of your members until the pool reopens, non-member fee of $20, and between now and when the pool opens, we decide on a scale system, as was just mentioned, for the different levels. And so that we get some money on the books for non-members, um, and we start moving forward, but we say, like, we will have a fee schedule in place by the time that the pool, and we will move to a fee schedule that we agree upon, whatever that is, 50 cents, $10, however it plays out, based on the different levels of membership. And that would be my recommendation for the motion. My recommendation, um is that we charge non-members $30, the members nothing, and wait at least a year to assess where we're at in regards to how much we're spending at the fitness center, how much it's costing us with employment. A curious question, Mr. Peter Peterson, are we staffed at 100%? I don't think we'll ever be staffed at 100%. <laughs> are we staffed, let's say, we need, a, a, if we had 80 employees, and we needed 80 employees, we're what, at 60 or 50? Stopping. More, more or less, overall. I don't know what your point is. Okay, well, I'm, I'm leading to my point. If we needed, if we had enough money to cover 80 employees, but we, we only in actuality have 50 or 55, we're still short 25 people, but we could afford another 25 people or 30 people. If we're short staff, it's because I've cut staff because we can't afford it. Okay, but okay, but we're not we're not at 100. I, I do I have I do a staffing guideline that you were part of last year for every department in this board. If you look at the information you have there on the budget and the PNL, the revenue and the expenses for the payroll is almost identical to my budget. 
I have not missed it hardly at all. Right. That's because I use a staffing guideline 